All right, let's go ahead and get started. Once again, thank you everyone for attending. Today's webinar is Assessing Cloud Readiness, brought to you by Data Source Consulting and EXL Company. Our speaker today is Eric Linneman, our Cloud Competency Director, who I'll introduce more in more detail here shortly. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Data Source Consulting and how and why we know about this topic. We are a pure play enterprise data management, modern data architecture, and decision intelligence consulting firm. And in 2016, we were acquired by EXL Service as part of their analytics arm. So we're really excited now to be able to offer the end-to-end -end solutions for managing enterprise data to providing those deeper business insights. And as far as how we deliver, we divide our services into two categories. We have our strategic work in data governance, vendor tool evaluation, data virtualization, and program establishment. And then we've got the implementation arm with the engineers and the architects who work with internal client teams to deliver on those recommendations we make to our strategy work. That includes architecture and cloud and BI and decision intelligence, data quality, and MDM. So let me introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Eric Linneman. Eric has over 20 years of successful enterprise consulting experience as a database engineer and cloud deployment and IT project manager, and he has deep experience with multiple platforms as well as technical and organizational leadership and modernization. Eric has won several awards for his excellent customer engagement, performance, and leadership, and we're happy to have him as part of our team here, so this should be a great presentation today. So our topic today is cloud readiness, and you know by now it's widely known why you'd want to move to the cloud, but it's important to determine to you know if your organization is really ready to make that move, and if not, what to do to get there. So again, thank you all so much for joining, and I do want to mention that if you have any questions, you can utilize the questions field at the bottom of your GoToWebinar panel, and we'll address those in the Q and A during the last 10 to 15 minutes of the session. So with that, I will hand it off to Eric. Thank you, Allison. So today we're going to talk about how to get to the cloud and, and the steps on readiness. And in this webinar, we're going to talk about what it takes really to create a map to move to the cloud. Uh, today we use our phones with tools such as Google Maps to find out where we're at, ways to find out how to get where you want to go, and then Uber to see where our driver is and how long until she gets here. The USGS still teaches a fantastic course on, on the national map right here in Denver. So maps are essential. Uh, we all need and use maps to get where we're going, and the cloud is no exception. You have to begin somewhere, and in this webinar, we're going to discuss how we'll build a map to see if you're ready to go to the cloud. We built our approach from a number of successful cloud migrations for our customers, from finance to real estate, insurance, and consumer services. Our methodology integrates the lessons we learned on these migrations. So the Oklahoma land rush of 1889 was the first land rush here in the U.S. in what's called the unassigned lands. The land run started at high noon on April 22nd, uh, 1889, so really close to 150 years ago, 140 years ago. An estimated 50,000 people lined up for their piece of uh, available 2 million acres. We have to acknowledge that this land was taken from a number of Indian tribes, including the Choctaw, Creek, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and other Plains tribes. But moving to the cloud is a lot more ethical, and people are rushing to get in the cloud. A number of people entered the unassigned lands early and hid out until the official time and grabbed some of the most valuable homesteads. This is where we get the term Sooners. Today, we call these people who jumped in the cloud early pioneers. Going uh, first brings some risks, which are listed on this slide, but the pioneers help teach us how to build our map, and the map's important for a number of reasons. First, the cloud is uncharted territory for some organizations, and these lessons learned can avoid a lot of problems. Secondly, the cloud is priced differently. In fact, almost the entire economics of the cloud is different from traditional IT. The cloud removes the economics of scarcity. You need more disk for the database, you just take it. But we have to avoid the model of the college student with mom and dad's credit card. Uh, the topology, services, operations, and security are all a bit different from traditional IT. So preparing for this and building your map is the responsible thing to do. We'll go into some more detail on that. And then finally, we remove fear by preparation. 
So data source has a cloud readiness assessment to determine your readiness for the cloud and build the map that leverages our experience, best practices, and proven expertise in delivering the cloud successfully. So why move to the cloud? Well, coming back to the Lewis Carroll quote on the first slide, I don't see how he can ever finish if he doesn't begin. You begin by understanding the motivation to move to the cloud. We do this for a couple of vital reasons. One, we need to know how to judge and make decisions based on the business drivers. Admittedly, there are some R&D shops which are looking at the cloud purely from a learning and experiment basis. But for everyone else, what is driving the move to the cloud? Our customers have wanted solutions that align with extreme seasonality, such as tax filing, look for solutions to present data to partners without allowing access to source systems behind the firewall, and modernization to a modern data platform that is 100% cloud-based. The cloud is an economic model implemented by software, services, and process. We absolutely need to ensure that this new economic model is acceptable to the business since we'll be spending money in a very different way. We need to know when we're done. This is pretty important. It may be done with a phase of migration or the whole project. Again, this has to align with the business goals that drive the movement to the cloud. And you can see a list of, of some factors in here that come into play, but your recipe will likely involve more than one of these factors listed here and likely ones that we have not listed. This needs to be understood from the start. It may change over the lifetime of a project, but to paraphrase Lewis Carroll, you need, to, you need to know how and where to start in order to finish. So what we're going to talk about today is five factors to success. And we've, our methodology is organized around this. And this is how we're moving customers to the cloud. People. We cannot do this without the right people with the right skills and the right training. Don't forget that the people who use your cloud solution will need to be trained and support this change also. Your IT staff needs to have some new skills and then likely a realignment from their current role to the new one based on the cloud solution. Process. Uh, what are your overall processes that will be moved to the cloud? This includes systems that feed or consume the data, scripted processes for business continuity, maintenance, integration, and operations. We also include processes that are done by people. These need to be evaluated to see if they can or should move to the cloud. And let's be clear, not everything moves to the cloud. IT resources. Let's step back to the slide before where we discuss the reasons to move into the cloud. Imagine you have a mission critical database that resides on hardware that's going out of lease shortly. Can this be moved to the cloud in a lift and shift mode, containerized, replaced with a cloud native service such as SQL DW from Microsoft? Have you simply run out of capacity in some critical resource and the cloud can remove that limitation? Remember, the cloud's an economic model in part because the vendors have removed the economics of scarcity. How do you accommodate this change wisely and not overspend? Compliance. This is becoming more and more of an issue within IT. From GDPR and California CCPA, lack of compliance comes with an ever larger penalty. I recently attended the O'Reilly Strata Conference and we learned that weaponizing data and hacking is now a major concern for businesses. In 2018, Harvey Nash and KPMG surveyed CIOs. Of the top three priorities that have grown, improving cybersecurity is the largest at 23%, followed by managing operational risks and compliance at 12%. The cloud can help, but you need to leverage experience and certified architectures. And lastly, finance. We're going to talk about this in some detail. The cloud can be bought in a number of ways. Vendors like Microsoft have incorporated the cloud in enterprise agreements, which specify costs for software. Services are usually priced with a utility model. The more you use, the more you pay, but at a lower granular cost. But it's not quite that simple. There are tiers of pricing, pre-purchase options, long-term commitments, all of which affect the cost of the cloud. Add in related and hidden costs, such as the cost to take data out of the cloud and finance the cloud is complex. But the cloud also gives you new tools to help identify your cost at a finer grained level. Calculating how much does it cost to run and deliver a specific report is now much more accurate. 
We all want to avoid sticker shock and a plan with knowledge helps diminish this risk. So let's start with our people. And with the people aspect of readiness, we're going to consider three groups in your plan. The first group is the current IT staff. It's no surprise that the cloud changes things for IT, whether it's skills, roles and responsibilities, or even the do I still have a job question. The biggest impact of moving to the cloud is on the IT staff. The cloud brings new architectures, technologies, challenges and opportunities. Let's consider a partner of data source, Snowflake Computing. Snowflake has developed a genuine data warehouse as a service in the cloud. Snowflake manages the data, optimization, operations, and availability as a benefit of their solution. So what does this mean to your DBA who no longer has to get up at 3 a.m. when you run out of log space? Who does the updates that are uh, now part of their role? This is all managed by Snowflake, so what is the DBA going to do? Keep in mind that your DBAs know the sources and uses of your data. The seasonality of the database use, such as quarter-end reporting and the like. Their experience and value can now be increased by training them to do higher value tasks, such as revising schema in a more timely manner than they've been able to do in the past. Aligning IT skills with the cloud is a must as part of your migration. Business News Daily last December listed the AWS Solution Architect Professional as the most valued certification in IT. To pass this certification, a person needs to understand the cloud technology at a very deep level, but also needs to be able to align the cloud with business needs in areas such as availability, elastic performance, and cost optimization. These skills give you and your team a much higher value of work than before. Our customers have realigned their staff successfully to maximize the value of the cloud, but it needs to be planned, communicated, and implemented well. The second group that we're going to consider is your users. There are cloud deployments where we're just doing lift and shift and little will change from your user experience, you hope. But the cloud also provides the opportunity to integrate new technologies such as machine learning, blockchain, and vastly larger scalability than before. This will change your user experience. So how do you prep your users to be familiar with multi-factor authentication as the critical data and services are now outside of your firewall and your security needs are even higher. As part of the readiness assessment, we evaluate the scope and impact of changes to your users in cloud migration. This is likely the most visible opportunity to prove the old adage, failure to plan is planning to fail. So preparing your plan for your users is vital. And then finally, we're gonna consider the stakeholders and partners. So this cl the cloud brings a level of connectivity and access that's not been available in traditional IT. We've seen businesses conform behavior to accommodate IT limitations, and the cloud in large part removes this limitation. How prepared are you to provide your partners, suppliers, and customers a set of APIs so that their solutions will call into your cloud service? Are they ready to work with you in the cloud? Are you aware of what you need to do to ensure that your solution is secure, available, and compliant? Again, new regulations like GDPR mandate that you work in certain ways. Say that you're a company based in the U.S. that provides a very special capability. You want to move this to the cloud and support your partner base in Germany. So now you're involved in GDPR. Can you verify that your solution meets the laws and regulations that your partner needs to be compliant with? Are your people ready and skilled on the impact of GDPR? These are important things. Processes. These are important also. Your cloud process will be a change from what your on-prem processes are. We recently completed a successful proof of concept for a customer where we moved from an on-prem hardware appliance, providing data warehouse capabilities into the cloud. During the test phase, we looked closely at the process of how reporting was implemented. They did a batch export from the appliance into a file that Tableau was then fed with. This was to accommodate the current concurrent access limitations that we had in the current solution. When we connected Tableau directly to the cloud data warehouse, all of the testers were able to query without limitations and had more timely data. These, these are the type of changes that the cloud will bring. But also with these changes, it mandates that you review your processes. Are your processes built to conform to technical limitations? 
are they meeting the needs of the business now and can they in the future? Can they scale to meet the anticipated needs and growth? If so, is the scale being done from a cost minimization approach or just pure brute horsepower? What are the properties of the proprieties of the business and are we aligned in our plans? Have you sorted needs from wants and wants from likes? Have you built a roadmap based on this prioritized stack? This is where the long-term value of the cloud resides. You now have the flexibility, technology, and breadth of services to say yes to one priority without that meaning no to others, but which comes first. Another prospect, another process aspect to consider is how you will use integration in the cloud. It may be integrating with a partner such as Salesforce, where you take the Salesforce cloud solution and either feed or consume data via a set of standardized processes. Doing this gives you an op opportunity to scale up and down services that your organization needs without affecting other services. It also allows you to use the cloud to segment access by business, business need, and without the costly model of replicating data for different groups. We cannot avoid the economics of the cloud. The cloud is a utility price model. There are ways to optimize and align costs, but these also require that you understand from the business perspective the need and value of the service. The benefit to this is that we can relate cloud costs more closely with business value than we've been able to do in the past. For example, let's say you're, you're using Teradata, which is a great technology, by the way. Can you price out the cost of the, uh, a report based on usage? It's possible, but is it effective? Cloud's an economic model that uses technology, again. Inherent in this is the ability to drive richer cost insights. Now we can better align cost and value. Are you prepared for that? Our methodology recently helped a global franchiser implement a complete greenfield modern data platform quickly with minimal costs. This environment supports 110 countries and upwards of 120,000 users. After a few months of usage and growth, we were able to advise them on purchase strategy that minimized cost and aligned well with their budgets, plans, IT operations, and seasonality. All right, let's look at your IT resources. So there's a multiple number of ways to move to the cloud. With all of these options, it's important to know your current IT architecture to understand the impact of moving. So let's start with the basics. Do you know your current software? It's likely a mix of commercial off the shelf, scripts, jobs, management, and monitoring tools and packages, as well as software you've built in-house over time. Is it all supported? Are the vendors still there? Earlier in my career, I worked in the Oracle ERP area. We often saw customers that had customized their solution so deeply that upgrade costs were substantial and a blocking factor. How's your relationship and knowledge of your vendors? Your vendor may have a migration path from what you're running now to a cloud-optimized solution. They may have specific caveats, warnings, and recommendations for the cloud. All of these need to be considered and factored into your roadmap, both from the time and cost perspective, as well as skills and operations going forward. It's likely that your licensing will also change with the cloud. Let's use another example from data sources partner Snowflake Computing. So to run a cloud native data warehouse, you have two costs to consider, storage and compute costs. Notice that there's not a multi-year license requirement. Of course, multi-year agreements will result in a lower granular cost, but it's not required. Does your database vendor offer a sweetened deal to move from on-prem to the cloud? Many do. The cloud is where the greatest growth is occurring right now, so it's the most competitive marketplace for software vendors. When you look at the big picture of your IT solutions, don't forget to factor in these integrations. Will, will this drive you to have a cloud connection directly to your data center? Will you incur charges taking data out of the cloud to integrate with legacy or on-prem? These need to be part of your analysis and plan for the cloud. Again, we come back to the economic model. A good practice for cloud development is to architect for failure. We assume that each and every component of your cloud can fail at some point, and we architect a, a solution that provides a level of business continuity to address these, with a caveat. Since the cloud is a different economic model, so and you do expend expense money 
but do you do it to address the theater theoretical problem without knowing the cost and impact of that problem? Of course not. Integrating the business continuity costs, needs, and alternatives is a needed effort in a cloud readiness plan. Do you know the complete impact of downtime for a system? How long can it be down? Can you afford to rerun a process or re-enter data, or do you need the availability immediately? We've had customers that could not lose any data, which requires a set of architecture models and testing, as well as to ensure that the customer can withstand a day of uh, downtime as an acceptable risk. Each of these business drivers helps inform the cloud topology that we develop. Finally, we're going to ask, how is IT structured at your organization? Knowing this becomes vital with the cloud. Purchasing services in the cloud brings ongoing costs, and it's very easy to find services that have been bought by multiple parts of the enterprise without a coherent roadmap. This is costly not only from a complexity standpoint, but the costs continue month after month. It's important to understand the IT structure in order to use the cloud effectively. And then let's talk about compliance here a little bit. Can you remember the last news story about a security breach at a company that you do work with? How many users were exposed? Millions? Tens of millions? What data was stolen? Was your credit card number stolen? They are no longer surprised. We have an obligation to secure our data, who can and how it is accessed, and how we prevent these issues. Recently at the Strata Conference in San Francisco, keynote speakers had a consistent theme. The risks and impacts of your data and process are more vital than ever. From state actors to organized groups of hackers, our data is at risk. This is an ongoing effort to secure access, but it starts with an initial plan. Now, ad adaptations of this plan will naturally happen over time in response to changes and threats. One of our customers had a poorly designed and managed cloud solution. Hackers were able to access and consume a whole lot of cloud resources, which directly translates into a large cost. So we implemented a robust tested security architecture and put an end to that. Adapting this defense in depth is now part of their culture and operations, and it's a big part of our methodology in preparation for the cloud. Aligned with this is growing world of compliance. It can be compliance in the field of health with, HIP, with HIPAA, which has been with us for a long time, to the upcoming 2020 rules in the California Consumer Privacy Act. Interestingly, Salesforce.com CEO Mark Benioff says that California's new privacy law could help with the crisis of trust that exists between the tech industry and consumers. It's our responsibility to address that tech, uh, that crisis of trust in the tech industry. Our customers have faced these challenges, and Data Source has a strong data governance practice, which the cloud team works with closely to ensure the solutions meet all the compliance requirements and that our customers are well informed about the solution. With that, you have two big questions you have to ask. One, do we know what compliance means and are we ready? Because compliance is mandatory. And two, what is the cost of non-compliance? We recently were involved in an effort with a, a group of large banks that were spearheading a project around compliance. The cost of compliance in banking regulations was estimated at $24.2 billion annually. It's a lot of money. While the cost of compliance is high, the cost of non-compliance are even higher. GDPR penalties can be as high as 4% of your annual revenue per incident. Factor in the loss of goodwill and building compliance in your cloud roadmap is a must do. So let's, let's take a look at the last facet here, which is finance. Cloud's an economic model imp implemented by a technology. You buy the cloud differently, than you do traditional IT. You spend differently. Your costs are different. If we look at the typical model of how you buy a database, you evaluate and purchase hardware, software, networking, storage, and other things. These are usually capitalized costs. The process of doing capital expenditures is complex and slow as it should be. These are long-term assets, and purchasing them takes time. So let's talk about a cloud model. Let's say you want to have a data warehouse in the cloud, and you're a customer on Azure. Same technical planning comes into play, but the purchase is very different, it takes only minutes, and the costs are expense and ongoing. Microsoft provides SQL Data Warehouse as a service that you literally can spin up in a few minutes. 
The barrier to entry has gone away from an initial cost perspective, but the ongoing costs are now very different and very important. One of the trends that we're seeing with our customers is they're experiencing sticker shock in the cloud. Building a plan and, and understanding these costs, a model on how to purchase the most efficient way, and how to anticipate growth in costs should be a mandate in any cloud roadmap. It is in ours. A customer of ours was not getting the value they desired from a cloud data warehouse and was being told by the vendor to purchase more. We were able to move them to a different technical solution on the same cloud platform that gave them the performance and cost that met their budget. Staying on the same platform meant that the, pl the implementation and testing costs were lower. These are things that would not be possible even just a couple of years ago. Since the cloud provides an ability to evaluate costs in a fine-grained approach, we also need to look at how these costs are used by the enterprise. Is your organization using a chargeback model or wish they could, but they can't because of the complexities of capitalized costs in traditional IT? Involving the leadership from a finance part of the house is a must-have in, in your model. The licensing model can be very different or it can be very close to what you have now. Do you know the advantages of each? Are you looking at short-term surge capacity or ongoing operations? You remember earlier we asked what's your recipe in moving to the cloud. Finance needs to be a critical part of this recipe. So we'll close this facet of the roadmap by mentioning the cost prediction models that all the cloud vendors now provide. They understand the risk of unpredictable or unsupportable costs to both their livelihood and their customers. Because of this, they all provide sophisticated tools that will help you understand how your cloud will price out, how to predict changes in these costs, and how to optimize your purchase of the cloud. The cloud purchasing op options are very complex, but easy to align with your business needs once you start building your roadmap. So let's bring these facets together and look at the big picture. You build your roadmap by starting with a cloud readiness assessment. This helps you answer a number of critical questions that need to be answered to have a predictable, successful migration to the cloud. These are independent of the size of your organization, although they'll be bigger the larger your organization is. We always start with a survey of the land. Where are you now? Where do you want to be? How will you get there? This includes the business needs, challenges, and long-term vision. From a technology perspective, it helps decide what goes to the cloud and what doesn't. Knowing these factors avoids cost, complexity, and risk. Keep in mind that not everything is ready to go to the cloud, but how do you decide? The plan starts with asking why. Why are we going to the cloud? The business needs to determine these goals. Do you have a capability you don't have? Do you need a capability that you don't have now? Is there a limit that you hope to overcome with the cloud? How will we determine what is a success in the cloud? This is your mission statement for the effort. To paraphrase Stephen Covey, your cloud roadmap, your cloud mission statement is not something you build overnight. It becomes a criterion by which you me measure everything. So once you know the why, your individual, re your recipe, you start asking the what question. The readiness assessment drives the priority of what goes into the cloud and in what order. We give you a coherent roadmap of the changes that you're going to implement. This is not optional. Even if this is a complete greenfield effort and no legacy items are going into the cloud, you still need to know, communicate, and implement the cloud resources in an organized way to be successful. A good example is one of our customers that does bond ratings. They've developed a very sophisticated algorithm and processes to calculate these ratings. These work well and they work very solidly meeting the needs of the business. This is part of their business, their processes, and their IT does not need to move this to the cloud for a number of factors. The readiness methodology helps them make decisions easier. The natural outcome of these two questions is the how. This is the core of the cloud readiness assessment. The detailed plan of the steps you will take to be successful to the cloud. It contains the five facets we've looked at, people, process, IT resources, compliance, and finance. Each facet is interrelated and each is important. Never forget you're building a map. When, when reality conflicts with what the map says, the map has to change. Understanding these core principles helps you build a better map from the start. 
The last thing to consider in using the cloud readiness assessment and artifacts is to use it to build consensus within your organization. Change is hard, and as we discussed, moving to the cloud changes some people's jobs. Socializing the cloud migration, the value to the organization, the opportunity to IT to develop new and needed skills and capabilities is a vital part of your cloud migration. We have people as the first facet of the effort and the most critical impact to your success. So this is a picture of the Malaysian Grand Prix from a few years ago. Formula One's one of my favorite sports. The knife edge of complex systems, technology, drivers, risks, weather, rewards, and a lot of luck make for unpredictable races, usually. Your cloud migration should be much more predictable, and it is with a well-formed plan. It's almost May, and May is the month of the Indy 500. So to quote Tony George, who starts the Indy 500 every year, drivers, start your engines. So it's time to start building your map, determining what it takes to be successful in the cloud and all the five facets we examined, developing your own recipe for success criteria, and move to a modern data platform. This first step is important, and we're there to help you start your engines. Now we'll open it up for any questions. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Eric. That was a great informative presentation. Um, I think we took a lot away from it. But we did have several questions come in, so let's get right to those. The first one is, with the cloud, how will my development change? That is a really good question. Um, again, in a traditional IT environment, you probably have production, you have a dev, you might have an integration level, and then a quality assurance or acceptance level. But in the cloud, because of the cost model, all of these are going to incur some operational costs. So usually we, we scale out a dev environment similar to production, but at a much lower scale with much lower costs. We also, when we license, we purchase with non-production licenses of software to try and keep costs down. And then we script everything so that we can recreate on demand and take it down and stop incurring costs when we need. Great, thank you. And then how do I deal with outages in the cloud? We have a process that we use now with our applications. You deal with it in the same way. It's a different architecture with a different economic model. So we, we evaluate how our architecture is going to handle failure. And we talked about that earlier. We script and we, we build for failure at every level within the cloud. If you look at a company like Netflix, they actually run process in their production environment, which takes every single item that they could have down in, in different steps randomly just to prove out the capability they've got. But again, it has to come back to align to the business requirements and the, and the actual value of having that redundancy and that architecture to provide uh, the, the failover capability. Great, thank you. Now the next one is, if I'm a network engineer, how might this change my job? Well, it might change it in a big way or it might change it in a small way. So most of our cloud migrations are hybrid where we have uh, services and data in the cloud connecting to services and data in uh, on-prem. So from that perspective, it doesn't change. But again, now you have a connection that goes outside of your network, outside of your firewall, with some different rules and processes. So your, your job as a network engineer actually expands. We get, you get some new skills, some new technology, and some new capabilities. Thank you again. And then the, the fourth one here is, how do I pick between Amazon and Microsoft in the cloud? Um, again, let's come back to the cloud being an economic model. So what, uh, what cloud vendor provides you the services that you feel will best align with what you need and at a price where you can negotiate to uh, have it at the level you're at. For instance, if you grow up primarily a Microsoft shop and have uh, large databases in SQL Server or SSAS, SSIS, it's a natural to move to Azure because there is a path going that way. The vendors are also sweetening their, their uh, offerings. For example, you know, if you have maybe licensed 16 cores of SQL Server on-prem, you may get an offer for 20 cores, the equivalent of 20 cores in the cloud for the same price. Uh, again, I can't quote Microsoft prices. We don't do that. We're not a reseller. But that's part of the evaluation to see which vendor aligns better 
with your business needs. There's some other factors that come into play too. Um, you may have a preference for one vendor or the other, and that needs to be taken into account. You may have partnerships with these vendors. Uh, all of these come into play and part of the recipe that we put together. Great, right, thanks, Eric. Got a couple more come in as well. Um, um, with a move to a new cloud vendor, such as Amazon or, or Microsoft, will this will this mean a whole host of other new software and developer vendors? It might, and it might not. So there there are a couple different modes. Um, we can take existing uh, software, existing services, existing packages, and move those into the cloud in an infrastructure as a uh, platform model. So we'll, we'll actually stand up virtual machines that provide the capability that you're used to and migrate the software in the same way. Uh, it could mean a modernization, moving from like a, uh, a data warehouse that's on-prem that you may be having vendor support moving away from to Snowflake. Or it could mean moving a database from what's either traditional uh, SQL Server or Oracle into RDS on Amazon or even a, a NoSQL database. So it, it comes down to the analysis of, of really what uh, your, your current model is and what your drivers are, either from a technical and from a business perspective. All right, thank you. And one more, one person here would like to know if you could just repeat the name of the high demand certification you mentioned at the beginning of the session. Sure, it's, it's um, Amazon's certified, it's Architect Certified Professional. So there are a couple of levels. Um, there's a certified architect associate and then a professional level. They also have DevOps and development along those same levels. And then recently this year, Microsoft or Amazon introduced a cloud practitioner, which is better aligned with folks coming from a non-technical perspective, uh, either from a business or business analyst, functional analyst type of thing. All the cloud vendors are, are growing and strengthening their certification. Uh, there's a number of different training methods and companies that are out there. Internally, we presented last year to our teams of nine different methods that we had for getting uh, trained and certified on the cloud. All right, All right great. Thank you. That is it for the questions for now. Um, as always, if anyone else has a question after we end the session, you're free to reach out. Um, and I'll have some contact information here as well, so we can answer those offline. Thank you. Um, 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 our next webinar is going to be in June. We don't have an official date for it yet, but as soon as we do, we'll be posting that information on the website. This is going to be on cloud-based analytics and data robots. So keep an eye out for that, everyone. Um, we hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and this will be available. The recording will be available on the website within the next couple of days, and everyone who registered will get an email with that link. So thank you again, and. Uh, this will be on the website as well, this contact slide. If you would like to reach out to Eric for any additional questions or to schedule an assessment, anything like that, his contact information is here, and you can reach him through the website as well. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.